Uh, well, uh, good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to Grand Rounds. It's uh, a great pleasure for me personally to uh, introduce our Grand Round speakers to you today. Uh, Liza Marshall is a graduate of Duke University and the University of Virginia School of Law, and she has practiced uh, in the past communications law in Washington, D.C. She also has helped to uh, uh, found a cancer support organization called the Hope Connections for Cancer Support in Bethesda, Maryland. And uh, she continues to serve in leadership roles with Hope Connections, her church and in her community. A fun fact about Liza is she is also a Jeopardy champion. Our uh, second speaker is Liza's husband, uh, Dr. John Marshall, who is also uh, my long-term friend and colleague who received his training at Duke University, the University of Louisville, and Georgetown University. Uh, currently, John is director of the Rush Center for the Cure of GI Cancers, which he established, and he's the Frederick P. Smith Endowed Chair and Chief of Hematology and Oncology at Lombardi Comprehensive Cancer Center at Georgetown University Medical Center. John is internationally known for his work in GI cancers, although today the focus is not uh, GI oncology. In 2006, Liza was diagnosed with triple negative breast cancer. Liza and John have written about their experiences with cancer and the impact on their lives and family. During today's Grand Rounds, they will together share this experience with us. So Liza and John, thanks for so much for joining us and uh, you should feel free to begin. Thank you, thanks very much. I, uh, we're really very honored to speak with you all today and, um, and to have been invited. We apologize for both having worn red. It was not intentional. When you've been married however many, 35 years, we uh, sometimes dress the same, not knowing that we're going to do that. But anyway, um, so just a, um, a, little, a little background on both of us we'll, um, uh, that's um, not so much the resume uh, background. Um, John grew up in Lexington, Kentucky. Uh, and was um, had a, a fairly typical, um, perhaps even idyllic in many ways, uh, you know, uh, Midwestern slash Southern 60s, 70s childhood, um, running around the neighborhood um, with his friends and nobody knowing what time you were coming home at night. Um, but unfortunately for John and for his family, um, John's mother uh, was um, diagnosed with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma when he was, I guess, about six. And... Um, died when he was 13, which was obviously not, not classic um, in many ways, but maybe for, for many of you is, um, is a similar story in that I think a lot of people who go into oncology have had some very close personal experience with, uh, with um, cancer. Uh, John ended up going to, as, um, as Dr. Benson said, went to uh, Georgetown University to do his fellowship um, in oncology. And um, he, um, uh, Georgetown at that time, the Lombardi Cancer Center was a breast cancer center. It was uh, headed up by Mark Lippman, who is world renowned for um, as a breast cancer doctor and researcher. And he brought over many wonderful breast cancer doctors and they really were the core um, of the whole practice really, I mean, and of the education program. And, um, and so John in an um, his John's kind of a can be a kind of a Don Quixote tilting at windmills a little bit, and um, for him this was you know breast cancer clearly had enough, and he was going to go into GI cancers, uh, which did not have enough. And John over the years has developed a real um, uh, advocacy, really strong advocacy for GI cancer patients, um, and part of that is turns on the fact that breast cancer has so much attention, so much research funding so many advocacy groups and um, October is his least favorite month. He, he doesn't mind the color pink in general, but the, the fact that everything is pink, that breast cancer is the month that everybody knows has really um, sometimes gotten under his skin a little bit. And he's been quite public about that. Um, 
And so uh, in 2006, I decided that John needed to be taught the lesson. That's not true. <laughs> um, John, but John did view as an ultimate, um, maybe a vengeance on him for, the, for his outspokenness about breast cancer. Uh, I was then diagnosed with uh, triple negative breast cancer. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's how it went. I, I met this woman um, across a, a, a beer keg, actually, at a fraternity party at Duke University many, many years ago. And um, we fell in love that night and have been in love ever since. And we got married right after college and um, uh, chased each other around as we got trained. Liza basically funded uh, our education, if you will. Her, my medical school and residency, we know we don't make very much money and fellowship. And um, uh, she got through law school. We lived in two different cities for a while which I know many on the audience uh, probably have done or are doing now um, to get where you want to go. Uh, we finally ended up in one city with two jobs and, um, and then started making a family. We had two kids. Um, and my career got busier and busier um, with travel and all sorts of things. And Liza working for a law firm and a communications law firm um, a uh, little bit like being a surgeon, I think, is that you're always on call and you always, whether it's Friday afternoon or not, and that lifestyle wasn't great for her or our family. And so sort of in an unspoken way, we began to, um, Liza slowed down her job, I sped up my job. Um, and as things went along, we kind of ended up in this kind of parallel play world. We still loved each other. We still were in love, but we became more of a business in a way uh, than a marriage where we were supporting each other in our activities. And Liza got, as continues to be very involved in every organization she touches and um, has a major impact in those. And, and then um, uh, one morning, um, or actually in November of the, the 15 or so years ago, when all of this takes place is um, uh, we noticed some, some changes in, in, in her breast. And uh, this was the beginning of, of, of a story that uh, really changed our lives. I, I thought I was already the, the best doctor ever, which I think most doctors probably have some little thought that they are that person. Uh, but I realized that I had a lot to learn and I learned a lot. Um, thank you. Uh, <laughs> my secret shopper, also secret patient, taught me so much about uh, our world of cancer medicine, what it's like, um, and part of what this is is sharing that experience so we all learn. So um, we'll, we'll um, let me back, well, actually, no, I'm going to jump forward, I guess, um, really, and um, talk a little bit our, about our writing process, because I think it's, um, the writing process is really a lot about how we approached, um, approached and then learned from, I think, our cancer experience. Um, we actually had an article written about us in a local magazine related to the, the organization that I'm involved with, Hope Connections, um, in 2013. And uh, after the article was written, a friend of ours um, read it, and she had actually been interviewed for it as well because she was very instrumental in running our meal train and, and lots of support during my, um, during my treatment. And she read the article and said, you know, you all have a... Have a um, interesting perspective that not a lot of other people do. You bring two different, very different views to uh, cancer treatment. There's, a, you know, this sort of obviously my patient experience, but I, I was a patient who knew more um, than the, your average patient and that I had been very much around John's world and had attended his talks and, you know, we, we, hang, we hang out with his colleagues. And so there was a lot I knew, but I was still a patient who really didn't know very much. And John being an oncologist who then had to become a caregiver um, and which was something he was not really used to being, not that he was not a great dad and all that, although our kids will tell you that he's not the person you go to if you're sick in the family. <laughs> not uh, unless you have a real disease. Right, right. He would tell us we should get a real disease. So as I say, my, <laughs> my revenge was that I got a real disease. Well, the only disease that he counted as real. So we um, started, uh, after she suggested, she read this, we we started trying to put something together and really just didn't have the time or the headspace to write at the time. And um, I think we've realized in retrospect, as, as, um, as we have accomplished this, that, um, that we, there was a lot that we weren't really ready to say to each other. There was a lot that we had broke, not a lot, but there were things fairly 
um, intimate and, and difficult things that we had suppressed at the time. And um, only with a fair bit of um, uh, you know, time under our, our feet could we, could we really say them, even write them down. Um, and, uh, and, and not only about each other, but I, my parents were honestly quite odd during this whole experience and I needed to deal with that. And then there was also our children and having them old enough to be able to, um, uh, I think to cope with, um, the, uh, the parts of this that they, in retrospect, as they have read the book, now they look back and say, gosh, you know, we, we really didn't realize both the severity of the situation and also how much we suppressed ourselves. So um, we, John, uh, over the years, John has developed burnout, which we will talk about, um, and, and really as a result of my diagnosis. Um, and, but as part of, the good part of that was that he decided he really needed to take a sabbatical. And Georgetown is, was wonderful and granted him that sabbatical. It took a lot of work to get there, but we got there. And Georgetown owns two flats in um, the Jesuit uh, College in Oxford. And so we um, were able to get one of those. And so we went there for four blissful months, right before, really uh, three months, ended three months before, sorry, it's gonna be crazy here today. Um, three months before the pandemic started. And um, we um, uh, were, um, sorry, I've been totally distracted by that. Anyway, we were able, able to write. We wrote separately every day and- um, I'll tell them. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> so um, the, I, I needed to get, the, the burnout issue here is that um, I've been at the same place forever. I've never changed jobs. I did my, I started at Georgetown in 1988 as an intern. And um, when you don't change jobs, you don't clean off, right? You don't get a reboot. And so having been there for a long time, that was one piece. The other piece was that um, I, after Liza's diagnosis, I got too close to patients. I felt like I wanted to try and replicate some of the care and we'll get back to that a bit. So with each new patient, with each patient dying of a GI cancer, I just felt very connected to um, uh, my patients. And so it became more of an emotional burden on me. Um, and so I needed, I needed a break and I didn't want to change jobs, but I wanted a break. And I was the first physician in over 20 years to even request a sabbatical at Georgetown. And it took a lot of work, actually, if you think about, it would have been easier to move, right? Because to take a sabbatical meant I had to find people to cover my patients. And I had to find people to cover my administrative duties and trials that I was PI of and all of those things. So I had to totally rely on my team, if you will, to take up the, 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 the effort and, and do for it. So we end up in Oxford and it was beautiful and lovely. And we end up um, uh, writing separately. So Liza would stay in the flat. I would go down to the library in the Jesuit college at Oxford. And we wrote for, uh, you know, really two, three months. And it became kind of a diary. We just sort of wrote Liza wrote more of a sequence of what happened. She had her chart, she had facts. And I wrote more about just our world of oncology and what it was like now to be a caregiver and the experience and the exposure. So mine's kind of more out there, if you will. Um, and Liza's was more to the, to the thread. And then later in that sort of November of that year, this is 2019, pre-pandemic, we sh swapped. And we read each other's pieces um, and really learned, as Liza said, some things that we hadn't thought or said to each other before. And it, we got through that. Our marriage survived that moment. Um, but then in the end, we came back and began to put together a book. We had lots of help um, and coaching us and editing us and organizing us. Uh, but in the end, we, we had something we thought was worth sharing. So um, a little bit about why we wrote the book. I mean, I think we, um, I mean, as John says, it was therapy for him. And I think important um, in his various roles to be able to um, really spill that um, in many ways. But we, we did think our um, combined, and, combined and separate perspectives really, we hope, um, bring something to uh, cancer care and um, from all aspects. So showing patients and caregivers what they can expect um, uh, from um, 
from various, uh, you know, from all the components of cancer care. And then um, also, I think showing, um, if you show the doctor side. Of yeah, the I mean, so I think our patients think of us as sort of superhuman and hero. They want us to be that, right? Because they have a serious illness and they, they really want to walk in that we, when we walk in that room, we, you know, the white coat is a cape, a superhero cape in many cases. So we need to make sure they know, I think, part of what this, this our, our experience, I think, shares is that we bring our own emotions into the room and we're not superhuman, objective uh, people. We bring, when they have a bad scan, we have a bad scan. So the more that we know what the others are doing, we thought, the better that that relationship is. And, and, and it just, we, we hope that's true. And so as people have, from the patient side, from the caregiver side, from the, the medical team side, that triangle becomes a really, really important relationship that we need to, to deal I'm with. They're calling from Brooklyn Health. They called ah. twice, I'm sorry. Liza's mother is uh, in, in a, <laughs> uh, and they're calling from our place. So maybe what we will do is um, take a brief pause while she deals with that. What we were gonna do next is read a couple of segments um, from the book um, that give you a, a sense of what we were thinking. Um, and maybe from that end, I might just go ahead and read both sides. Let me see if Liza's is on her way here. We apologize for this. It's, all of a sudden, of course, busy here at our house. Um, I, let me skip actually, and I'll come back to reading in just a second. But um, Liza's original diagnosis um, was a shock to us. Um, and part of what was shocking is that I got her report from her biopsy. So um, she had had a biopsy before, she, um, which was benign. She had some changes to her breast, which we both saw. Um, and so she was getting another biopsy. She had gone on to a clinical trial, the first of three that she enrolled on, which was a biobanking clinical trial. And then when um, we had sort of forgotten that she'd had the biopsy, kind of hoping that this was going to be negative. Um, but in the end, um, uh, her I got copied, HIPAA violation, by her, on her path report. So I was going through my morning um, uh, records a long time ago before there was an EMR. I got faxes. Um, and there in there was a breast cancer biopsy in my stack, and it had Liza's name at the top of it. Everything okay? <laughs> okay, so I skipped ahead a little bit. But what we'll do is go back now. We're back together. And we want to read you just two quick, we'll take a second to read you this, uh, give, you a sense, a <laughs> give you a sense of our perspectives on this. Yeah. How differently we both, we both saw things. And we wrote these without knowing we didn't know the, the other one had written at all. The other was writing. Yeah. Um, a week of Charlie and Emma are our children. A week later, two days after my first chemotherapy treatment and on the first day of Charlie's and Emma's winter vacation, the whole family piled into the car and drove to the hair salon to select my new wig. I wasn't going to do that without everyone's approval. I wanted John to feel as comfortable as possible with how I looked during the next four to six months. And a 14 year old boy and a 10 year old girl can be brutal. I didn't want to embarrass the children any more than I was already with my high-waisted jeans and one breast, the former they had expressed, never the latter. Admittedly, Emma had suggested I get a blue mohawk wig, which I politely declined, so I wasn't sure how much help they were going to be. Hans from the salon came out to greet us and took us back to a private area. He first showed us his wig room, where he must have had a hundred or more wigs jauntily placed on styrofoam heads. We oohed and awed and started to whittle down the selection. Hans placed me in a beauty salon chair in front of a mirror and the fun began. Everyone had a ball. Being sick with cancer was not fun, but there were some moments of joy that I tried to hang on to. We went through quite a few sandy blonde short hair wigs until we settled on one that had a bit of spike to it. It looked mostly like me, but let me be a bit edgier than I was normally. 
Everyone enthusiastically approved it. Maybe mom would look a little cooler now and Hans placed the order. And not knowing Liza had written that, I wrote this. One of our family's fondest memories during our entire breast cancer chapter was wig shopping. Liza tried on some new looks, blonde, brunette, metallic, spiky, flowing. The kids and Liza seemed to be having a really good time with smiles of joy all around. I was not sharing in the joy and I tried to hide it. I was not going to dampen the high spirits this time, but with every wig, every modeling walk down the runway, I saw Liza not with a fresh hip look, her wig not as a prop to prevent the unavoidable public stares from strangers, I saw Liza as being really sick. Even though I have spent my professional life reassuring patients about being bald and extolling the glories of wigs for women, I am painfully aware of their shortcomings. Wigs never fit quite right. You almost always can tell that someone is wearing one, but like the socially risky question, are you pregnant? You can never ask. As patients go through chemo, most lose weight, their face is thin, they become pale and the wigs get looser and looser, slipping around and needing constant adjustment. Some patients insist on wearing their wigs everywhere, determined never to be seen bald. Some patients lie dying in a hospital bed and insist on wearing their wig, now so loose that it stays fixed to the pillow as the patient turns her head to greet you. As I watched Liza try on the next new look, I remembered my mom's wigs. I remembered the look of all patients melting away in front of me, wearing a wig that had become an inadequate reminder of their former self, now half covering their eyes. When Liza tried on the next wig, all I could see was her dying. Liza and the kids broke into my darkness asking, what do you think of this one? I love it, I answered. So we came at this differently um, and the perspectives, the, the impact of Liza's diagnosis was sort of different. And I learned a lot. As I said, I was the one who was on the phone with Liza. We remember this morning, this Monday morning, or Monday before Thanksgiving and 15 years ago, very, well, somewhat differently. The facts are different, but the impact was the same as that I'm on the phone with Liza and say, you have cancer, which you thought was quite funny. Yeah. Didn't you? Yeah. yeah, I thought I did think he was joking because I couldn't figure out why he would be telling me that. It seemed very odd that my husband would be the one would be telling me that I had had breast cancer. And fortunately, the study that she had been on was also the path was copied to the principal investigator of the study, a doc named Moneta Liu, who's a breast cancer specialist now at Mayo Rochester. And she walks into our office and basically takes the phone from my hand and and takes over. And at that moment, my, my moment of being Liza's doctor stops and I begin my journey as a caregiver. Um, so we, we have things that we think we learned from this experience that we uh, or hope to, um, to pass on at least in some form, maybe just a different way of looking at things. Or um, So the first one is um, what we call the wham effect. And I, I for you know, a patient, and a caregiver, it's that shock of diagnosis. And, um, you know, I think, you know, I, I kind of, you know, I look back and I think, you know, obviously I had, had had a biopsy, my breasts look strange, you know, and I hear this from so many people, you know, you go through the process, but you don't ever really believe that cancer is going to be the diagnosis. So, you know, and you know what the odds are and really, you know, odds are pretty much in your favor that it's going to be, you know, going to be something benign. So um, the second somebody says that to you, you know, your brain shuts down. And I'm, I'm sure many of you have had this experience with your patients. You see their eyes go blank and you realize nothing you say after that is going to go in. And yet you have to say things and patients have to hear them. And, um, you know, I was, was very fortunate in that John did immediately step in and his brain did not shut down in the moment, um, particularly, you know, it just, shut down emotionally. <laughs> yeah, right, right. So, which may have been a good thing. I mean, in some senses, you, well, we, we'll talk about that a little bit too, but um, so, you know, he said, you know, here are the things you need to do. And, and, you know, he was thinking through all the steps of, of getting me, you know, onto the, all the next steps and into scans. Um, and so then, you know, the, um, you know, the patient and again, the caregiver in many cases is experiencing panic and, um, and then being given so much information and the, the, um, 
you know, that overload of, 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 of the various decisions you have to make. And with lingo that you really don't understand, um, I, you know, I was um, immediately asked, I was, I was saying before that I uh, sometimes have to explain um, if we do, if we're talking to a different group, I have to explain the term neoadjuvant. Well, I was immediately offered a, a trial which had neoadjuvant therapy. And of course I had no idea what that meant. And um, in the, I, it was described to me and I immediately rejected it, which was wrong because it is now pretty much standard of care in breast cancer. Um, fortunately, all the other trials I picked um, all have negative results. But anyway, I am still here and I hope that I have contributed in, in some way to, um, to the furtherance of cancer care. But that, you know, that really brings um, to light this, this is one of the things you're immediately asked to do. Here are three trials and these are the components and these are drugs you've never heard of. And here's another drug that we might add, which we don't normally, but you have to decide if you think that's a good idea or not. Um, so I think that's very difficult. And also many people, of course, don't really understand what um, uh, the options are, uh, for what, what standard of care is, and then what a clinical trial is. Another decision you have to make is where you're going to be treated. In my case, it was, um, I obviously I had wonderful resources at Georgetown, but everybody knew me there. Uh, we had had a strange experience with our son in which somebody went to our, into my chart after he was born and knew more really, I and mean, everything was fine, but it just, it felt a little bit of an invasion and I just wasn't sure I really wanted to be at a place where everybody knew me. Um, uh, so, and, and did I want to be in a private practice? I ended up choosing Georgetown. The question of whose advice you listen to, and of course, not only do you hear from your, from the healthcare providers, but you also, you know, everybody who's ever had a breast cancer diagnosis wants to tell you how you should be treated and what things you, what nutritional supplements you should be taking at home and, and all of that. So there's, there's, again, just this overload of information. And then I think the final part of that is we really learned you know, how much both fear and hope are motivators, uh, really strong motivators. And so um, I made some decisions uh, probably out of both of those that were, you know, maybe not the, you know, we, we joke, I eventually went off the trial I was on. I was on a, I was on a trial that was added, that was basically six cycles of AC and six cycles of taxol rather a than- A swag trial, yeah. Northwestern was swag. Oh, so. yeah, rather than, rather than four. Um, and- well, You guys are ECOT, my bad. <laughs> And um, then eventually, about halfway through, I ended up, well, really right in the middle, I dropped off the trial and added a platinum drug all because of because the famed Mark Littman had sent John a five word email out of the blue, um, suggesting that I try a platinum drug. So uh, as I say, you know, that's, I'm sure you get the, you know, the crazy uncle who has all sorts of ideas. And, and this was my crazy uncle. And for whatever reason, I decided to do it for really, and I, when I say whatever reason, that means there was very little reason to do it, and yet we did. So, uh, and it threw a lot of things into, um, in, in, you know, into disarray, particularly making making life difficult for my oncologist, which I, uh, you know, feel terrible about in retrospect. Um, yeah. So, and then I, you know, I've been experienced, you know, what it is to be a caregiver, and I don't know if you feel this way, but I used to be kind of irritated at the spouse or the daughter who was with the patient because they were the one asking all the sort of nudgy questions and when's that gonna happen? And did I get this spelled right? And um, did I get, you know, do I understand? And they're, they're the note taker, right? And they're also the detail person who keeps us in line. And um, before our experience, I used to sort of find them, you know, just they took up too much of my time and I was directing all of my uh, attention to the patient. Well. After Liza's experience, I realized that that caregiver is probably the most important person in the room to get the message. Because as Liza said, you know, the patient's not really hearing a lot of stuff. And I really worry about patients who don't have caregivers. Those are the, and during the pandemic, that was an added burden. If your spot was like mine, they couldn't come in with the patient. And so they had to be on a Zoom or on a phone somewhere. And it just wasn't the same in terms of information exchange. And so I began to increasingly value that, that caregiver um, and that caregiver role. And in fact, that sometimes it was probably harder to be the caregiver than it was to be the patient, at least emotionally. Liza acknowledges or, or brought up, actually, it's in her part of what she wrote about, is that you know, she gets the, the, the baskets and the cards and the things like that, whereas the caregiver does not get any of those. They just get the extra duties of taking care of everything. 
um, and being the pit crew. So um, that and was- And maintaining health insurance. And maintaining, <laughs> <laughs> keeping a job going. Um, um, but one of the things that kind of emerged for me too is this, because there were a lot of things that I couldn't say to Liza, right? Because if you're a really good caregiver, you go off and you research and you study. I could have called the PI of Liza's study that she went on and said, why'd you, why'd you design it this way? Why, what was the talk in the room uh, about you know, the arms that ended up coming forward? I could have done that. Um, I was in a position to do that. I was invited to tumor board, uh, for example, but it's like, no, I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna do that because every time I thought about that, I went to a very dark place. Liza had near inflammatory triple negative breast cancer. And so all I could think of was, you know, chest wall involvement and terrible things that happened to patients. And so I had to partition that off, but I didn't have anybody I could really talk to about that. And so I was thinking about being strong for each other, what that means. And sometimes that means not saying anything, just keeping it to yourself and holding it. And it took 15 years for me to unleash those feelings. Um, but um, they, they, that was a very important lesson about you know, the impact of a cancer diagnosis on relationships. When we're seeing those people across the room from us, you know there's stuff going on. Maybe the relationship was good. Ours, in fact, was kind of parallel as I described before, but it kind of brought us back together um, in many ways but sometimes it drives people apart. And so we have to be in real time assessing the team across from us uh, and understand uh, them. And to that end, what do people know? What, how many people know about their diagnosis? This, this ripple effect of what we're saying to patients during our one hour new patient visit, how is that getting out? How's that being translated to their kids, their parents, their friends and family, um, and managing that information, I think is really important. And we're critical uh, in all of that. So those are lots of lessons we learned. The, the realities of cancer care are, are, are really shocking if you start to see it from the other side. So Liza, you, you kind of brought it up about all of this data dump that we give and our concept of shared decision-making. There's no such way we can ever really have shared decision-making. But if we could, the reason we do it the way we do it is that we don't know the real answer. We don't know what is the correct thing to do. I'm in a patient discussion right now about do we give chemo first or do we do surgery first? And we're throwing all of that data to our patients and saying, well, this is where we are. What do you think, right? And then stepping back. And then to a patient and team who don't really know. So um, it's, and, and we need to acknowledge the fact that uh, we're putting it over there as best we can and then stepping back. I've changed my practice to now voting, right? I, I will say, here's what I think I would do in this circumstance and here's why, and here's the reason you might not decide that, but I actually vote more than I used to. The second thing, um, is that grade one, two toxicities matter. So if you look at a, a study presentation and they show the toxicity table, you see the grade three, four column and the grade one, two column. I usually scan the grade three, four first and say, oh, that's not too bad if those numbers are low. But if you then look at the grade one, two, those tend to matter a lot. To, to watch your wife walked down the street with grade two, was it? Hand foot, three. grade three hand foot syndrome, but it was grade two for, it was, yeah. um, you know, is, is, is rough. Um, so what we put our patients through, even the minor side effects uh, really matter. So I became uh, quite a, a, a hawk about side effect management, dose modifications, you know, how much we put people through and making sure that we can we can justify it. Um, sort of the, the next thing I really came to is that the, this, our patients have an impact on our mental health. Um, it certainly did on me. Um, I ultimately think I burned out. I don't think I became impaired. Um, I hope I didn't, but I needed a break from patient care and from the mental strain of managing patients and the demands that 
it puts on us. Of course, this is quite topical now um, with the pandemic, et cetera, um, and the, the impact that that's had on healthcare people in general. Uh, but I think in our world, we have to acknowledge that uh, this is uh, something that's real um, and we need to, there's no answer here, but that, that it's real and we need to talk about it. And how are we gonna manage that going forward. So uh, it's there's that threesome, if you will, of the medical team, the patient, and the caregiver it has mental impact on all. And then the last from, from me on this is that we were special, right? So we got treated really nicely. We didn't have to call and make appointments. We got treated like kings and queens. And as the chief of the division, and the clinical director of our cancer center, after our experience, I tried to replicate that. I felt guilty about what we had. Well, not really guilty. I felt this is the way to do it. If we could do this for everybody, this would be good. Um, and in trying to do that, I recognized fairly quickly that no way. We could never replicate for every patient the kind of care that Liza and subsequently I got. Um, through that, but we need to recognize that there's variable care and variable um, impact that we can have through that. So trying to optimize that while trying to stay sane uh, is a tricky balance uh, from all of that. Um, yeah, and you, I mean, your patient navigator, you have, you have developed some, it certainly improved care at the cancer center because- We moved it, we moved it some, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so, uh, and then so the last area is just, you know, what life is like um, for, for all of us, I guess, after um, a cancer diagnosis. Um, and I, you know, I'm very fortunate to be in the survivor um, category. And, it, you know, in, in 15 years ago, it was not really a, an area of practice or I think acknowledgement. I mean, everybody's just, you know, delighted that we got you through chemotherapy and we're going to sit and wait and see what happens now. And yay, you've made it a few more years, but um and you know, I'm I'm really happy to see how much survivorship as an area of practice has has grown, um, and because it is there is there are long term effects of a cancer diagnosis, and certainly there are physical effects on um, a cancer patient. Uh, you know, and you know, I have neuropathy, and I have you know, I've had breast surgery. I'm going to have to have breast surgery again. Um, but there's you know, there's also that um, obviously the emotional impact, and I, I think. Um, for cancer patients and caregivers, you're, you know, you never see the world the same way again, which can be good, and, but um, can also be, uh, be difficult. And, um, uh, you know, then the, the, for the healthcare team, this whole question of wellness and um, burnout, the, um, you know, not only obviously do physicians take this, you know, I had wonderful chemotherapy nurses who, you know, one of whom has been there, I mean, she, you know, everybody goes to the famed Mercedes at Georgetown who, who um, takes care of everybody. But, you know, she, she also walks home every day and, and is very much in the trenches with patients every day. And, and because of, that's what makes her a wonderful nurse. But I am sure that, um, that it also makes the rest of, you know, she has to learn to cope with that outside of, um, outside of the hospital. So um, I think we, those are areas that we um, would both like to see grow, both the, the, um, the continuing of of uh, looking at survivorship for cancer patients, and then also looking at the wellness of the healthcare team and ways that those can be supported because it's in, as patients, it's in all of our interests that oncologists continue to do the wonderful work that you all do um, for many years because you build up experience and um, knowledge that, that just can't be replaced. And so, um, you know, I mean, again, and that's true, not just for oncologists, but for the whole healthcare, healthcare team. So. Um, those are important issues that I, you know, I'm glad to hear that they are coming out now and more and more and that people are talking about them and looking at ways to improve those. Yeah. And I think, you know, just in, in closing, um, and we're happy to take questions or hear feedback on what you guys think and react to all of this, but, um, you know, one of our biggest take homes for us and ones we try to share with our patients is sort of not forgetting to live. When you, when you have a diagnosis of cancer, it's sort of life from one scan to the next, um, one treatment to the next, that's your calendar, that's your cadence. And in between, what are you doing? Are you just waiting to see what happens, You know, holding on for dear life, or are you getting to continue to live? And certainly the pandemic 
has doubled down on this. This has made it really hard for our patients because they can't go do the things um, that you would normally do, but it's true for us too, right? So we need to make sure that all that, that the only thing we're not, don't just see patients and write notes and write papers and things, make sure that what we're doing on our side is also not forgetting to live and enjoying uh, the time we do have. So for our patients and for us, um, uh, having that be a priority, I realize that's sort of holiday Pollyanna, but I think it's really important that we somehow fold that in and, and appreciate the blessings we have. I think Liza's uh, term for this, or, or an extension of this is um, showing each other grace. Um, I don't know if your world is like mine, but you know, if, if we get a bad Yelp review from a patient, it can actually affect our compensation for goodness sakes. And you know, our patients treat us increasingly like we're just service people and not the professionals that we are. And um, I get that on some level, but um, you know, in our country is not about showing each other grace right now. Um, but I think we need to get back to that in our, in our own microcosm of our patient caregiver uh, medical team interface, but also on a larger scale um, uh, in everyday interactions. So one of the things that we took away from this is the importance uh, forgiveness and showing each other grace and, and mercy as we go through life. So with those two uh, end of year messages, uh, mm -hmm. we'll, we'll stop here. I don't know, uh, uh, Al, if there's any questions in there, but we're happy to take questions or feedback uh, this morning. Thanks for listening in, everybody. Uh, th thank you, uh, Liza and John. And uh, if there are questions, um, please either uh, voice them now or you can put them in chat. Um, <clears throat> maybe to start, you, you both brought up a whole host of different issues that could be expanded upon, but <clears throat> one is um, certainly there's been a tremendous amount written about burnout at every level within the healthcare system. Do um, you care to expand a, a little bit on that, having felt that that's what you were experiencing and what measures, for example, are you taking now to try to prevent that? I'd like to know that question. <laughs> um, so I, I think the, there were two components to the burnout uh, pre-pandemic, pre-sabbatical. Pre and one was just the consistent new patient, our young patients with colon cancer and other GI cancers, a lot of patients dying of metastatic disease, a high proportion of our patients die of metastatic disease. Um, and being connected to them. So I was just feel, and so I was starting to like, instead of bring energy into a new patient visit, for example, I was, I was sort of faking it now. I was, I was bringing, I was sort of like, oh God, I'm gonna watch this person die in two to three years. And I'm gonna to have to hold their hands through all of this. And did I have, you know, I was just tired, frankly, of, of being that emotional crutch for them and for the team as we dealt with uh, these patients. And, um, and the reactions that even our own team had to 32 year olds with metastatic colon cancer, right? So um, that was wearing me down. But also as the administrative head of the cancer center, um, just the, and the changing times of healthcare and all that we have to go through, the burdens that it was placing on the entire team. So whenever anybody had a bad day at work, it came to me that could we, couldn't we change the process or the flow or the, you know, couldn't we optimize how we're treating people, right? So I just was feeling all of those burdens quite personally. Um, and could, could I, you know, be there for everybody? And if I wasn't there, it wasn't going to go right. So having this sort of Jesus complex on some level that I had to be the person to deal with all of these things. And um, so those were wearing me out. And it, what was nice is that when I went away, I actually didn't miss it. It was great. And the cancer center survived. And the cancer center <laughs> survived. It's still standing. So um, one message that if you don't change centers, right, 
if you're at the same place for many, many years, uh, I think we do need some sort of um, structured break, a true sabbatical. And most of us don't work for true institution, you know, academic institutions, or it's we work for, you know, the practice plan now, and they don't know about sabbaticals, right? So we need to figure out how we're going to build those things in for longevity, because it's better for the healthcare system for us mm -hmm. to take a break and still work there than to change healthcare systems, well, right? And move out of move out, healthcare altogether. Right, move out of healthcare altogether. We're, our drain is to the pharmaceutical industry, right, right now, um, because that just looks better, grass looking greener right now. So our staffing issues and all of that are, you know, to a, to a, a, a different kind of practice. And so we're losing highly trained, really good people to uh, non-patient care, you know, kind of settings. So we need to watch out for that. Uh, if you are changing jobs, that may solve some of it. I see less burnout among people who do change from one institution to the other over time, but that's not, most families don't want to do that. They don't want to do that. After I've been trying, and I think I'm doing a pretty good job so far, I'm actually making people use the EMR portal to talk to me. So instead of my personal email and my cell phone, um, I'm driving people to the portal so that when it's my time. I do it regularly, right? So I'm still quick about it, but it's on my terms. Um, and um, so I've found that using that sort of patient communication through the EMR has helped me maintain that personal connection, but on my terms. Um, so I'm not seeing somebody's scan report right before I go to bed at night or first thing when I wake up in the morning. Like, I, it's not until I'm ready to turn on the EMR and look at it. So for me right now, that's been important um, for that. How are you doing it? I mean, it's the same for you, right? Well, I think uh, I think all of us uh, are very aware of the stress and strain. And uh, I think uh, COVID has made many of us more aware of spending time with our families. And actually we are <laughs> with uh, right, right. being at home. And so I think uh, all of these issues are important discussions as to how we can help people. And in fact, uh, maybe uh, more emphasis at spending time at home and this hybrid model is something that will help. I think we need to explore this with people further, how helpful it is. Some people love it, some people not so much. Uh, there is an, uh, another question here. It says, my mother was surprised with a breast cancer diagnosis decades ago and often says that any health issue has her questioning if it is something more. And it still produces anxiety for her and uh, my dad. In your opinion, does that uh, PTSD-like response ever go away? And how do you negotiate that feeling of, uh, is it back? Yeah, yeah. Well, that's uh, sort of what I was referring to. Yeah, um, as part of the, you know, the mental um, aspects of survivorship. I mean, I, I do think, um, you know, I, I, there's a, there's, there's sort of a, a, a tension between a guilt of, ha of being a survivor, knowing many people who have not been um, and feeling as if you shouldn't, you know, you shouldn't complain about anything because you're still here. Um, but recognizing that there are long-term effects, and I, and I, and that's certainly a strong one. Is not is you know you just you don't have your innocence anymore about um, about tests and bumps and you know headaches and you know generally I, I think we um, you know I don't know that I necessarily have an answer about how to cope with it. Um, I you know I mean I. I honestly, I, I'm big on therapy and I think one can, um, you know, one can benefit from that at, at any point in, um, in one's life. And actually our, I, I kind of, we've been laughing about, I'm, it's not me, I'm laughing about our daughter, our, our daughter's anxiety, ha ha. Um, <laughs> but um, she, um, she had had anxiety for years and I'm really was born with it. And uh, she jokes that every, every therapist she talked to, they'd say, well, your mother had breast cancer. And she's like, Oh no, it ha that has nothing to do with it. I've had it all my life. And then she she read this and she said, um, 
you know, I think I need to apologize to every therapist I ever talked to because apparently it actually had much more of an effect than she realized. And so I, you know, I think, um, I think being able to talk to somebody about those things and, you know, there are, I mean, it doesn't have to be therapists. I, you know, there are support groups, survivorship support groups in that, in which I think, again, just being able to share those emotions with somebody else and then maybe being able to leave them there a little bit and, you know, go out for your week or your month or whatever. And, um, and set them aside is, um, can be really beneficial. I mean, I, you know, what if, I, I, at least when I open somebody's CT scan, right? The stage three colon cancer, I'm following up their scan or whatever. Um, I, I have a little bit of anxiety mm -hmm. when I open that report and I go to the bottom and I'm like, okay, no evidence of disease. And then I can go back and read the subtext. But until I see that, I bring to that moment, I mean, obviously a different level of anxiety, but um, so I think we, I think each of us probably does that on the medical side, and um, you know I think uh, so we're sharing in that PTSD a mm -hmm. little bit. Back to the to the questioner. Um, so, um, but you know, from it's a perfect question, mm -hmm. and, and I think the answer is no. It doesn't really go away. I think you, yeah. I I have always thought to myself or my observation of patients who think they're cured and are hoping they're cured, um, that they're, every time they get a test result, their anxiety level, the scanxiety roller coaster is really high for them. And once their cancer comes back, if it comes back, you actually, it's sad, it's crummy, but their anxiety falls, you know? Okay, I know where I am now, right? It's that, uh, what you know, I holding- the weight anymore. Yeah, I'm, I, it's a different, place that they are. And so that I think, and I tell this to patients, the hardest point of a cancer diagnosis is that after diagnosis, after adjuvant therapy, waiting window. I think that's the hardest for any of our patients emotionally. Um, there are harder places there, but the emotional anxiety there is really high. So the questioner is spot on. Uh, it's a problem. Another question, uh, I guess for John, how did you deal or cope with going to that quote dark place while Liza was getting treatment? Um, it was not easy. I, I, I became a fairly significant insomniac um, and, um, uh, and, and I just had to partition it off. I mean, I, it was like, an, I had this sort of imagination of putting it in a box and and keeping it there. Um, and it, it, it really uh, took a long, you know, with Liza's diagnosis, the, the, the general, the triple negative breast cancer, the general only positive to the diagnosis is that if it doesn't come back in three to five years, it probably isn't, unlike the other breast cancers, which can come back at any time, really. So when we got to that window, I think it, I relaxed a bit that Liza's headache was not a brain met, right? So if Liza had a, right, or, a, you know, some funny pain somewhere wasn't a rib mat, right? Liza had a few complications afterwards. Uh, she was on a bisphosphonate study, a prolonged bisphosphonate study afterwards, also a negative study. Um, but she, she was an event on that because we were exercising and had a, a, a bony, a, a little micro fracture in her thigh. And I'm like, okay, that's a, that's a mat, right? Um, and it turned out not to be. It was a complication of the bisphosphonate. But, um, uh, but how do you not go there? So um, the caregivers, you know, I, I didn't, I was not naive, right? So that I, but, but I couldn't actually then share that with Liza. I had to keep that to myself. There's been... Uh, increasing emphasis on value and, and many of the patient advocacy groups are, are really pushing on this issue that when we all get together talking about value, where is really the patient's voice in this discussion? Uh, do you have any uh, thoughts about uh, kind of with your experience in terms of value, what type of message in terms of value? Yeah, I'm not sure I'm the right person to ask that question of, uh, in that I, I, I tend to, I tend to be on the value side of that. I mean, I, um, you know, I, I, I've, 
you know, the idea of spending a hundred thousand dollars for two more weeks or whatever to me doesn't make sense. And, and, uh, you know, I mean, obviously that's, I also was a public policy major in college. So, you know, I, this global, you know, having to make policy that applies to everybody and then facing individuals in those situations who want to live two more weeks because there's a wedding or a baby or whatever and don't care what the quality of their life is during those two weeks. They just want to make it the, you know, whatever. I mean, I, when I use the two weeks, that's obviously stand in for whatever, but, um, you know, I, um, yeah, go well, ahead. I was just going to say, we, we, we bring this up because, as yeah. you know, Al, I, I, this has been a theme for me of, uh, in, in, in my career of can we justify these costs? And, but then, you know, that's from a policy big picture perspective. And, um, you know, the bill that's in front of Congress right now is to try and just allow us to negotiate drug price, for example. Um, and we haven't had that. Um, but then when the gun was actually pointed at us, you're like, we want everything, right? Well, so yeah, I'm well, not sure that's actually it true, wasn't but, well, but no, so we, you, you know, yeah, you can tell the events. Well, well Liza, Liza hadn't thrown up. She was in, I don't know which cycle of. John was, and I tell this story differently too. I had not thrown up. She had not <laughs> thrown up. So, but anyway. We just she, focus on different things in so, the story. <laughs> so, um, you know, Mineta added amend to Liza's, um, uh, treatment. And I did some really stupid husband thing. I said, you, you weren't even that sick. So I was like making the value argument. Well, well what he said was, do you know how much that costs? And I didn't, <laughs> of course, because again, but I mean, I think one, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, but I think one of the pieces of the value discussion is the fact that patients don't know. I mean, how would you, how could a patient make a value judgment when they have absolutely no idea how much things cost? I mean, that's not completely true, of course, because there's a wide variety of insurance and for some, and, and some people don't have it at all. So there are certainly patients that are very cognizant of what value is or what costs are and what, and, um, and even what their copay is, which may vary across drugs. But it is, we are, we are set up in a situation in which patients can't really generally can't even think about that. Yeah. And so then, then when you're, you know, in the thick of it, um, you do what you have to do, um, and uh, so, and it's very hard to separate uh, that out in our system. Now, the rest of the world is figuring out how to deal with this because they don't have unlimited resources, so they're having to make decisions. We are now. I think one of the negatives, one of the many negatives of the pandemic, is staffing. Right, so now we're having to make Sophie's Choice-like decisions of who gets that chemo slot, you know, the week before the holidays and who doesn't. Because <laughs> right. there's only so many slots and there are more people that need them than we have slots. So, um, you know, we were getting limited resources that are making us make difficult individual decisions that sort of have a value feel to them. Uh, who needs it more? Limited right? resources. Um, for limited re so, We'll see how this, uh, how we go forward with this, but I do think um, we now can talk about it. Um, whereas before, you know, it was something that we were not allowed to to think about or talk about because it was our business model as well, right? Right. Well, um, one quick question: uh, Is the book available? Yes, it is <laughs> for those who uh, are. Uh, interested further. Um, but Liza and John, thanks so much for joining us uh, with some uh, important messages here. And uh, I, I think we're now on break from Grand Rounds till after the holiday. So wish everyone a happy holiday and thanks for joining today. You all are great. Thank you too. Bye. Bye.